Right, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mark Sondrop, together with me, Wendy Spearman. It's our pleasure again to welcome you to the now monthly COVID-19 Project ECHO meetings hosted by the University of Cape Town and Department of Medicine. We are forever grateful and thankful to the University of New Mexico, Albuquerque Project ECHO for extending their license to us and allowing us to run this since uh, 2020. We're now almost at one year. Uh, again, this afternoon, we have a full program. And apart from thanking uh, University of New Mexico, again, our thanks to the Department of Medicine, in particular, Sahana Rangel, uh, as well as Claire Jeffries, and from the, from the Gastro Foundation, um, Karen Fenton and Cheryl Valentine, who assists us with Project ECHO. Before I hand over to our chair for the afternoon to take you through the program, uh, just to note that uh, many have, would have joined these meetings over the last year and you would have seen the term Project ECHO. I'm sure you've become more au fait with it. Please note that uh, there are a variety of ECHO programs now running in South Africa, including viral hepatitis, gastroenterology, and a range of other ECHO meetings. Please inquire accordingly in terms of uh, uh, whether you'd like to join that. But with further ado, over to Graham, all yours. Thanks very much, Mark, um, and uh, welcome to everybody to this uh, second webinar of, uh, of the year, COVID-19 webinar hosted by the Department of Medicine. Uh, the focus of our webinar this afternoon uh, is on SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, um, and there's been a huge amount of interest for obvious reasons uh, in this topic, uh, and we welcome everybody attending today. So we've got three talks and uh, we'll start off with the talk um, as has become our routine, uh, a talk uh, with an update uh, on the COVID-19 epidemic uh, in the Western Cape with some discussion around the rollout of the vaccine in the Western Cape. And that will be given by Andrew Bull uh, from the School of Public Health at UCT and the Department uh, of Health in the Western Cape. Thanks very much, Andrew. Uh Thank, thanks very much, Graham, and, and to the organizers as always. Um, let me just check that you can see my screen. Yeah, seeing that. Great. So um, <clears throat> this is the, the integrated slide that we that we very often show, and the red arrow is where we were a month ago when Mary Ann presented. And subsequent to that, we've seen a further abatement of, um, of, of cases um, admissions, mortality, um, and test positivity. Um, so um, just to, to maybe comment on the test positivity, because that's often been our best marker, that's the yellow line at the bottom. We're now sitting at between 5 and 6% of uh, tests being positive, which is pretty much where we were at our lowest point back in um, after the first wave back in September, October. Um, but we are doing 20, about 20% 20 more tests now at this point than we were at that at that point, so we still have slightly higher case numbers than we did at our um, at the lowest point after the after the first wave. And um, it's a bit curious that the admissions are only are still quite high relative to our peak admissions compared to how much everything else has come down. And I'll talk to that a little bit in a moment. This is the active cases by area, and it's just uh, we don't have to spend time on it just to kind of reflect that. All the case, the active cases in all areas have come down. Again, we're not quite at the lowest point we were previously, but there's no area that's standing out and, and suggesting that the, the cases are unusually high um, uh, com com compared to where, where we've been previously. Um, looking um, at the admissions, the um, public sector admissions, which is the kind of the, the, the solid line, lighter green, um, we're down to uh, just under 500. Um, uh, Conf uh, admissions, current admissions and patients have confirmed COVID-19 within the last 21 days before admission. But um, that is, we're only reporting about 250 cases in the COVID services. So when the hospitals themselves say, this is how many patients we have on the COVID service, the number is lower. And that is because there's quite a lot of long patients in long-term care, psychiatric hospitals and other hospitals that, um, that count in these case numbers because they are accrued from simply uh, the, the lab data overlaid with the admission data. Um, and then there may be some cases in other parts of the hospital that aren't known to, to the COVID service. And that phenomenon seems to be playing out even more in the private sector. All, all the private sector hasn't come down quite as much. So we're not as low, admissions haven't come down as much as they did 
last time and, and we will continue to show uh, an ongoing number of, of admissions that may not be due to acute COVID illness um, whilst we are at this, this point of, of fewer cases as we did last time. To talk a little bit about mortality, you'll see the green line is the excess deaths and you'll see that the the second, the second wave has followed the excess, or the excess deaths have followed the second wave very, very closely this time around. And the solid red line is our best estimate of confirmed, um, of confirmed deaths by date of death, taking into account that the, the, um, the kind of uh, uh, peach colored, um, which is the Department of Home Affairs deaths that we ascertain after the fact that we're mostly out of hospital. There's still a little bit of a, at the peak, there's still a bit of a gap um, we've shown previously that some of it can be explained by the um, uh, uh, false negatives when you've got high, when you've got high pretest probability, um, but we also anticipate that there's um, some diagnoses not made, and I'll talk to that in a talk to that in a moment. The MRC's latest report that came out yesterday, um, for the first time after the second wave, we are now have the, the total deaths for the Western Cape now fall within the prediction bound. Um, that, 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 that they provide. Um, so, the, so the excess deaths have come, to, come down uh, quite, quite dramatically. For the first time, the MRC yesterday released a report where they try to estimate uh, what proportion of the excess deaths are COVID related or COVID-19 deaths. And they do that by looking at the period of stable uh, ratio between the excess deaths and the, and the reported deaths. And they do this separately for each province and nationally. And then they upscale the reported deaths to, to one over that ratio throughout. And then, then during, and you'll see that the lighter, the, 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 the smaller dots represent um, this method. During the peaks, this gap between the upscaled uh, deaths and the, and the excess deaths is greater. And they ascribe that as collateral deaths. So they, by that estimate, they estimate that nationally the collateral deaths are between uh, five and 15% of all excess deaths. And that number is smaller for the Western Cape um, when they do it by province rather than, than nationally. This is a slide that we showed uh, late last year after the first uh, wave uh, peak. And it looks at deaths um, last year in blue um, for diabetes and HIV. Um, and these are deaths that are measured on the hospital platform. So uh, it's quite similar when we use um, home affairs data on the ID number. Um, the orange are the deaths in, in, in 2020-2021. And the gray, but excluding uh, those with uh, uh, COVID diagnoses. And the gray are deaths in 2021 with COVID diagnoses. And you can see that for diabetes, where we have quite a strong association between diabetes and, and COVID mortality of between two and fourfold. Um, we, the gray lines coming up showing a very clear um, uh, increase in deaths in patients with known diabetes during the two peaks in June, July, and then <clears throat> December, January. But, but we also see the deaths uh, in patients without confirmed COVID going up just during, during those peaks, the orange, the orange bar relative to the blue bars. And uh, you know that that could represent um, collateral deaths in terms of care being affected, and it could also be um, undiagnosed COVID-19 given that relationship. But we don't see that same phenomenon with HIV um, mortality. It doesn't mean that there is not still collateral impact on HIV um, morbidity and mortality, where even HIV diagnoses and so on may not even be being made in patients who are who are acutely ill and where the acute care services have been impacted. Um, but, but just for us, the, the fact that this, this pattern has been repeated twice for both illnesses is um, we found quite interesting in terms of understanding the excess mortality. Um, I'm not going to present any detailed data. I think the, these data will emerge and the, the people producing them will be able to talk to them um, um, as, as they emerge. But just to summarize where we are and understanding uh, uh, things. So um, in terms of the transmissibility or of, the, of the new variant, um, to, to explain the, um, the replacement of, um, by the new variant, uh, estimates use, the estimates that we're hearing are that one of the efficiency of transmission or the duration of transmission or the probability of reinfection has to be increased or a combination of them to, um, to explain that. And some of those estimates uh, uh, will emerge similar to how they have in, in other countries. In terms of severity, uh, a month ago, uh, Marianne presented uh, the analysis um, of the associations with mortality and the association of, of, this, of the second wave itself and showed that 
we definitely had higher mortality in December, January than we did in um, June, July, but that was attenuated when we adjusted for service pressure. With uh, more data and, and refinement of the analysis, we're now showing that we don't fully attenuate that higher mortality in the second wave and the NICD are showing the same. But that said, we still don't think it's interpretable as, as great a severity because the, um, there's a number of factors that, that could explain that, including residual compounding of service pressure that we don't measure as well as we would like to, and, and, and uh, potential selection bias um, uh, in terms of who gets ascertained. So there is a case control study that is uh, ongoing um, and will be um, pursued as the more sequencing data become available um, uh, over the period of um, a crossover period where um, both variants were, were circulating. Um, in terms of uh, reinfection, we are able to enumerate people who've had a diagnosis twice. We can't verify it as a reinfection and some of that work is being done by the virologists. Um, and that represents about one and a half percent of second wave infections. But we know that many more second wave infections might have been infected previously, but weren't ascertained previously. And we just don't know what that ratio is, but we know it's a, it, it will be a, um, a multiple of what we're actually measuring. Um, and there is the opportunity to also look at the, um, those who've uh, had serology done um, uh, to anonymous, anonymously link uh, the serology with the um, subsequent diagnoses and work out those who are seronegative and seropositive and subsequently got infected. And it does look like there is definitely protection from previously being infected, which um, is encouraging given that one of the vaccine trials didn't show that protection in the placebo arm. And we've also shown ecological data to show um, high assumed previous infection due to um, proxied by high standardized mortality um, provided inverse, inversely correlated with second wave mortality. And then on the serology, the, there's work undergo, being done now on convenience samples um, post second wave. And uh, Marianne previously presented that the pediatric and the HbA1c residual samples proved to have a better distribution um, and alignment with, um, with uh, measured mor morbidity and mortality um, than the HIV and pregnancy residual samples. And those are being, um, those are being repeated together with HIV for, for, for continuity. And we will get private sector residual samples this time. Um, we're not sure when the blood transfusion services will be able to report for, for the provinces that they haven't reported for yet because it was related to a regulatory issue on the platform that they were testing on. Um, we will get one opportunity to triangulate a household survey from Mitchell's Plain with our residual samples from a study that the NICD have done um, post second wave um, or towards the end of the second wave, which will be useful to us. And the HSRC National Household Survey, which included um, Western Cape, they have not reported yet and um, they do have data but it's, uh, uh, for the short term, it's not going to be definitive because there were issues around timing that crossed between the, the um, periods as well as the response rate. Um, just uh, to, to flip onto vaccines in the next talk. Um, so this is the national um, number of people uh, registered as health workers uh, to be vaccinated. Um, you'll see the Shaoting and the Western Cape being um, by far the, having by far the greatest uh, uh, numbers of health prof professionals and patient-facing health professionals. And in the Western Cape, that's 113,000 registered. So, so clearly the, the availability doesn't meet the potential demand um, even amongst healthcare workers. And the data that we have so far in terms of um, uh, who's been vaccinated is uh, 14, uh, 14,500 uh, Healthcare workers in the Western Cape have been vaccinated. They're the kind of purple line in the bottom right graph. So you can see a fairly um, uh, stable uh, rollout over, over time. Uh, Tigerberg and Hutterske being obviously the main uh, rollout sites. Uh, we're still waiting in for individuated data so that we can profile who's been vaccinated in more detail and also link back who's been vaccinated to, um, to other data we have on <coughs> COVID infections and uh, clinical events. Um, we do have a, a, a passive way of ascertaining um, uh, healthcare work infections within the public sector specifically, which provides quite a useful uh, sampling frame for looking at potential impact of vaccination amongst healthcare workers or a subsample of healthcare workers. Um, 
and so we're just going to. I think I'm sure Linda Gale will talk to <coughs> talk to the to the trial and the and the phases. But we're just going into the second second tranche, um, uh, where um, uh, we're hoping to do a similar number of vaccinations in the province, and the usual acknowledgements of our very many colleagues who contribute to these data. Thank you. Thanks very much, Andrew, uh, for that update. Uh, as usual, really great to get that real-time reporting of what's happening in the Western Cape. Um, so we're going to move on to our, our second talk uh, today, which is going to be given by Professor Linda Gale Becker. Uh, Linda Gale is a professor of medicine at UCT, director of the Desmond Tutu HIV Centre at UCT, as well as chief research officer of the Desmond Tutu Health Foundation. Uh, Linda Gell is a, a physician scientist who, who's internationally known for her programmatic and action research around ART rollout, TB integration and prevention of HIV in women, uh, youth and MSM. And over the last year, uh, Linda Gell and, and her research teams have, have focused uh, their work, uh, in addition to the work on HIV and TB on uh, COVID, um, and uh, have, have Linda Gell's had a prominent role in both the ensemble trial as co-PI in South Africa uh, and now co-PI of the Sisonke trial. And it's incredible to think that this trial is just two weeks old. Um, it was put together at, at a rapid pace and has really provided a mechanism for healthcare workers in South Africa uh, to access uh, the J&J vaccine and, and really looking forward to, uh, to an update from, from Linda Gale about this. So thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Graham, and uh, the Echo Clinic, and apologies, I didn't change the title of this slide. One's doing everything um, at speed just at the moment, um, and I actually had to give feedback to the provinces this morning, so apologies for, um, for not changing that. I thought I would start with really which vaccine are we talking about here, and I know this may be, uh, but just to get us all onto the same page, uh, we are talking about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, um, and it is an AD26 based vaccine. Of course, uh, the platform is well known for other pathogens as well. Um, Johnson & Johnson has used it for RSV. We have an HIV trial actually in the field at the moment. Uh, known as Imbocordo, uh, but it has also been used for Ebola, malaria, uh, as you see, Zika, um, and other uh, aspects. So well-known, well-tolerated, um, mostly mild to moderate AEs, uh, really no significant safety. So we start with a good, a good candidate in that regard. How like all the other vaccines that, or most of the other vaccines in the field at the moment, uh, the, uh, the candidate was decided uh, based on the pre preferred and presumed best antigen being the spike protein. Um, and obviously wanting something that would express antigen would be scalable, would be immunogenic, uh, stable um, and easy to roll out. So that really is what drove uh, the the J and J uh, product um, early data very promising as you see here in in non human primates um, looking at uh, the antibodies elicited um, and uh, again really laying the groundwork to go forward and those those studies are all now published um, looking again in the new non human primate at lower and upper respiratory tract um, SARS-CoV-2 viral load um, before and after vaccination or in controls and, and vaccinated uh, rhesus macaques. Um, and again, very promising data out of the NHP. So um, we have a vaccine that is monovalent. It's composed of a recombinant replication incompetent and no type 26 vector. Uh, it encodes the spike protein and is administered as a single dose. As you see, I am into the deltoid muscle. Um, what are the phases we've seen so far? Well, we had um, interim phase one, two, um, that consisted of a number of different cohorts um, spanning all the way from 18 to more than 65 years. And the, there is a longer term cohort with a two dose schedule that is also under investigation. 
What is the interim data out of those early studies? Well, again, the vaccine certainly does look immunogenic um, and uh, there are also impressive T cell responses. So both CD4 T cell and CD4 8. Um, and really, again, uh, I think reassuring that no safety concerns uh, had some reactogenicity. Uh, reminding all of you that Ensemble was conducted here in this country. It was the phase three looking at efficacy, safety, and immunogenicity. We enrolled about 7,000 people uh, from South Africa, of which 2.5%, 2.8% were HIV positive uh, worldwide. The other, the other regions were North America and South America. Um, and the end point was to look at moderate to severe critical COVID after 14 days, and then moderate to severe critical COVID after 28 days. And these are the top level results. Uh, sorry, the paper is not yet published. Um, so I'm, I'm presenting what many of us have seen really coming out of the, the FDA report mostly. And there we saw a 66% overall efficacy for preventing moderate to severe 28 days. 72% effective in the North America, 86% overall in preventing severe disease after 28 disease and complete protection against COVID. Importantly for South Africa, the update at the FDA was that we see 64% protection in South Africa, where again, we captured mostly our second wave and mostly the B135 uh, one lineage. So here is a Kaplan my just to bring that home. Uh, and we seem to be seeing this data going out uh, further now, again, with good immune responses beyond 100 days um, and, uh, and safety looking good. So here is the safety. Um, solicited local and uh, adverse reactions were higher in the vaccine group than the placebo, mostly due to injection pain site, uh, site pain, um, more so in young people than older. When it came to systemic adverse reactions, mostly headache, fatigue, a little bit of myalgia, a little bit of fever. Um, seven uh, severe adverse events, um, and more of this detail is available in the FDA report. Um, but again, a good uh, safety report. Um, perhaps most tantalizing uh, was this that came out of the FDA report. We have seen this data also presented to SAPRA um, that there is starting to look like there may be a trend towards efficacy against asymptomatic SARS-CoV-2. Um, and the, we just don't have significance yet, but it is starting to look promising. So in summary, uh, you know, it's an adenovirus vector vaccine, uh, immunological data looks good, phase three interim an analysis is encouraging, and just remember that very easy to manage vaccine, um, and hopefully we'll see all the phase three data published soon. So switching gears a little bit, of course, everybody is now very aware of the situation about two and a half weeks that feels like six months ago uh, when it became apparent that we had a problem with AstraZeneca as per the study that was conducted here and reported by Dr. Mahdi, Shabir Mahdi. Um, and this table tries to summarize that what is missing is not that these vaccines don't work, but it's data around the 51YV2 of uh, the, the, the variant that's circulating at the moment. And what was important, literally, as we had just locked the data on Ensemble on the 28th of January, was that we actually did have data on the ground uh, of the, uh, the new variant uh, in response to this vaccine. And so uh, at a great speed, uh, we negotiated with the NDOH that rather than have a hiatus of no vaccines when the country was really poised to start their rollout, that we speak to Johnson & Johnson, um, mobilize their research product from around the world, 
and ask uh, separate to approve a 3B rollout um, uh, or, ro or, or study uh, an implement implementation study that would involve healthcare workers. So here again, you see the data graphically presented. Um, we based this on the fact that we had uh, knowledge of safety, of efficacy, an easy vaccine to roll out, but we had this problem of it not yet being licensed in South Africa. So a plan was formulated to make a pragmatic real world phase 3B clinical trial of this single dose for frontline healthcare workers in South Africa. And we really are wanting to fill that gap that would have occurred uh, with no vaccines, with su some vaccines, uh, at least while we gear up for, for the national uh, rollout plan. Um, and so Sasanki is a research study evaluating effectiveness. It has a focus on frontline healthcare workers. Um, as, as a result of this, we are able to provide early access, but of course it is in the context of an implementation science. It's not the usual kind of clinical trial. We don't have a randomized, uh, as it's open label, everybody is, uh, is allowed to enter if they are eligible. Um, and uh, there obviously is an ongoing look at eff effectiveness, given that we are in this real world situation um, and uh, safety. So to this audience, our primary endpoint is to assess the effectiveness of uh, the SARS COVID, this ad 26 vaccine on severe COVID hospitalizations, uh, particularly and death, of course, looking at healthcare workers. Um, and here we are going to be very reliant on people like Andrew, uh, the DATCOV data and other data to be able to have a comparator arm in the general unvaccinated population in South Africa. We obviously are interested in the incidence of symptomatic and severe SARS CoV 2. Uh, amongst those who are vaccinated, we want to look at the genetic diversity of breakthrough infection. We do have a nested, more in, intense study uh, that hasn't yet got off the ground. We are hoping to get that off the ground very soon. Uh, and we also want to um, look more carefully about asymptomatic infection in that group. I think this is a good indicator of vaccine hesitancy in the country. Um, and of course, pharmacovigilance will be ongoing. So Sasanki rollout has already begun. We, I wanna make the point that we are nesting this implementation science study within the national vaccine rollout plan. So it, it, it is within that context of kind of putting the research on the front end to manage the IP, to manage the GCP, but we are still relying on the the machinery, if you like, of the vaccine centers and the vaccine rollout. So I'm not even gonna go through this data, but suffice to say that we're using the electronic vaccine uh, data system. We've inserted a component of a, an electronic consent into this, which will be removed when Sasanki is no longer required. Um, and we have literally inserted this into the process. So people will still move through the process of, of getting onto the system, having a voucher issued after they've signed consent electronically, then being invited to vaccine centers. There is a handover of a vaccine uh, filled syringe uh, to a vaccin vaccinator who's registered um, and the individual then finishes the course uh, as it was laid out uh, through the usual process. So I'm not going into the detail here, but just to say there really is a well-defined uh, machinery in the background that has been devolved to the provincial and then to the vaccine center levels. What have we done so far? Well, we needed to start uh, in a smaller way. So we chose 18 mostly public, public sector large hospitals to begin with. Uh, these were supported by, in the first instance, the ensemble research sites uh, who are supporting each of the vaccine centers. Um, and in this second two week period, we've expanded this to include some private hospitals as well as moving into more rural areas. So you see now 49 sites. And as Andrew showed, 
as of last night, uh, we had uh, entered 80, nearly uh, just over 82,000 people. Um, we are moving into our second tranche of 80,000 vaccines, uh, doses, and those are rolling out at this moment. What have we heard on the ground? Well, uh, there is quite a lot of, there is a very, I think, good safety desk. People are able to actively and passively submit their, uh, their adverse events. I think we've had about 2,100 submissions so far. Um, and these have mostly been mild reactogenicity. Um, so we're trying to get these various uh, messages through to healthcare workers. It can, of course, be used in lactating women. We don't, uh, at the moment, have permission to give this to pregnant healthcare workers, but we have an amendment in the works uh, to come in at second trimester, at least. Um, it is open to people with comorbidities. In fact, we're targeting people with comorbidities um, and those who live with HIV. Um, we are certainly allowing people with allergies in, although we are asking them to let us know if they have allergies. This is the kind of thing we've put into the vaccine centers to make sure people are aware that it is a reactogenic vaccine. Um, and the last thing is probably the biggest concern from healthcare workers is when is it my turn? How do I do this? How do I get on? And we are learning a great deal about the electronic system, about how to sequence people, how to prioritize people, how to make sure that they aren't queuing but that we don't have vaccines drawn up with no deltoids to put them into. Um, and I'll probably stop there uh, and just say that it's been a huge privilege to be part of uh, you know, this program. Um, and, and I think it's a wonderful example of a rapid translation of research uh, into you know, moving towards implementation um, in, in an incredibly impactful way. So thank you for that, Graham, and I'll end. I hope I didn't take too much time. Great, thanks so much, Linda Gell, for that really excellent overview. And, and um, also just uh, thank you and congratulations to the leadership of, of the Sasanke trial for, for what is just a remarkable accomplishment. You know, it's been four weeks since this was conceived, two weeks to get it all ready, and within two weeks, over 80,000 people are vaccinated, which is just, just a huge accomplishment, so, so thank you for that. Um, Linda Gall, I believe you need to go to another webinar, but are you, can you take a few questions? Absolutely. In fact, but, it's an MRC function that I have to shoot off to, so apologies okay. to everyone. Okay. So, so um, just um, if, if I can ask you, um, you know, one of the issues that has come up is, is um, obviously the ensemble sites were all within urban, well, ma majority within urban areas, and getting the vaccine out to our colleagues in the rural areas is, is, is going to be a challenge. I mean, you, it's been a remarkable achievement what's been achieved in the urban areas, but thinking about rural access, uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so quite correct, Graham. This is our, our, our big nightmare. Is what, on the one hand, to make sure that private sector is incorporated within this, but also, um, and all cadres uh, across the board, um, but then also um, to get into those rural and primary healthcare areas. So uh, innovation is happening there. In fact, we don't have an ensemble site in the Northern Cape, for instance. So we have imported <laughs> a site into the Northern Cape. So thank you to the Joburg Ian Zana Right to Care Group who've gone um, in as an ensemble site to, uh, to uh, the Northern Cape. We, our job as researchers and our GCP is to make sure that the IP, the vaccine, is drawn to the right level in the right way into those syringes. So uh, that is the critical part, if you like, of the, and then the oversight to make sure that everything is running smoothly and everything and safety is being paid attention to. So we, we are able to distribute our researchers um, as long as they take their pharmacies or designated GCP individuals with them. And obviously also again, because this vaccine has a little more flexibility around mobility, um, we are also starting to get mobile uh, units up and going, which again have a researcher on the one end making sure that IP is well taken care of, uh, but getting vaccine out in that way. So at the moment, we're in part in this relevance here. We're in George, 
um, in Paul and in um, Worcester. Uh, but I think we'll be trying to penetrate from each of those via mobile clinics. Um, and again, innovation on the research side. So, you know, paying tribute to Andreas Diakin, uh, to the group's fam crew, to the various your group, uh, others who've been prepared to say, you know, I'm, I'm willing to go um, and make this happen. So awesome. And then Linda Gale, just um, in terms of moving towards licensing by SAPRO, uh, can you, do you have any idea of what the potential timelines in that regard are? Yeah, so um, everyone will know that over the weekend an EUA was granted by the Federal Drug Administration. That's really important because that's the primary regulator that um, that J and J. Obviously, this vaccine has been largely also funded as part of Warp Speed. Um, they are also submitting to the European Agency as we speak, and we've had a rolling. Uh, approval process going at SAPRA. So we have already shown them the data out of Ensemble. Um, now the dossier has been submitted. Um, I think we're kind of imagining uh, a mid-April readout um, and, um, you know, not wanting to, this is speculation on, on our part at Sasanki. Um, and obviously there are also options maybe for a section 21, the way government has, uh, the way SAPRA has issued for Pfizer. So, mm -hmm. so that could be a kind of a quicker way to bring mm -hmm. things in before an EUA. Uh, but I, I think we're thinking Sasanki is the stop gap at least until mid April. Okay. I've, I've got one other question, but I see there is a question posted in the chat. Um, are people being screened for previous COVID infection or positive serology prior to vaccination? And are previously infected individuals being included? Yeah, so yes, uh, previously infected people are included. We are recommending that you give yourself 28 days after your last uh, symptom, just because reactogenicity does seem to be a little more vehement in people who have recently had COVID. Um, and so just think about that a bit carefully. Um, the, the immunity is an interest, a really interesting question. So we are hoping to do that in our 10,000 person um, sub-study, which hopefully we'll get off the, we, we make just confirming funding for that. Um, but hopefully that will allow us to do three uh, different time points for uh, existing, um, uh, immunity to SARS-CoV-2. I, I know people have raised background immunity to add 26. I just want to point people to a paper we wrote some time ago when we were doing the Pambili add five study. We uh, we did a seroprevalence look for add 26 vis-a-vis add five, and definitely there's far less background seroprevalence to add 26 than add five. Mm -hmm. Um, and I see there is another question there. Can high-risk staff, in other words, people with comorbidities, return to their clinical role once they are vaccinated? If so, Million dollar are... question. <laughs> I, I, you know, interest, I'd love to hear what you guys think. I was just saying to Robin, and I actually posed it to UCT to ask them what their policy is about this. I mean, what we know is that vaccine, the, the vaccine uh, effect starts to take, you saw the Kaplan-Meier from even as early as day seven, but day 14, you're starting to get quite good efficacy um, at protection and day 28, really protections looking very solid. So, you know, do, can we then say to individuals, well, you know, you're, you're, you're being protected against uh, disease and death um, for you as an individual, you know, is that possible? I, 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 I'm not sure what the policy is anywhere, whether anybody's thought about it or indeed what the policy is turning out to be in North America. I'd, I'd welcome other thoughts. Yeah, you know, I think that, Linda Gale, you know, I think it's obviously, it's, it's a decision that will need to be made within an HR framework, but, you know, I think given the evidence that it's preventing hospitalization and death, um, you know, I think, you know, that people could, could return to work with, obviously, with PPE in place. Um, and this, and, and Graham, just to again, reiterate. Yeah, and just to reiterate, this is why we're going, we, you know, we're targeting healthcare workers, recognizing this is the force that needs to stay on its feet and be available should we run into more problems down the road. So that was the thinking 
of involving healthcare workers in the first way. And, and, and given that you, you're getting uh, pr more protection at, uh, after 28 days than you are getting at 14 days, it makes sense to say that the person's high risk, they wait till 28 days and then, and then return. But obviously that needs a framework okay. for that decision to happen. Um, and then I, I, I just want to pose one last question um, related to the, 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 the primary question in Sisonka, and, and perhaps Andrew can also contribute to this, but um, the, uh, the question of, of vaccine efficacy, comparing it to the general population, now it's, it's quite obvious that the, their risk profile is quite different. And just uh, so you, you know, you're going to have to make adjustments in that analysis. And, and any thoughts about how you, you see a vaccine efficacy when you're actually comparing two different, very, two very different groups in terms of their risk? I'm going to hand that right off to Andrew. <laughs> Andrew, I'd love to hear what you think first. Yeah, so, so uh, I mentioned the fact that we link um, the public sector uh, employment database uh, for health workers to, um, to, to, to new infections. So if we had the person level data on who was vaccinated, we'd be able to compare at least within healthcare workers. That's not to say that the national department can't do the same. Uh, then initially there was a concern, but I think the registration of healthcare workers has actually been pretty good. So we do have a sampling frame of healthcare workers nationally as well, so that you can compare within the, um, those who did and didn't receive the vaccine. Um, the, in fact, the Western Cape might in some ways be compromised because we have very actively prioritized people at higher exposure and clinical risk. And so those vaccinated versus those not vaccinated might look a little, might look a little bit different. Um, and we don't necessarily have digitized data on that, ex that exposure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but uh, but I think definitely uh, comparing to health worker to health worker rather than health worker to general population is is the way to go, and I, I hope that nationally that that will also happen now that we do have that something frame. Right. Thank, thanks, Andrew. Thanks very much once again, Linda Gallagher. Really excellent to have that out with you. Um, Thank you. We're going to move on to our third talk uh, uh, today, and that's going to be given by Professor Penny Moore. Uh, Penny is the Saatchi Chair of Virus Host Dynamics at WITS uh, and at the NICD and is also a Senior Honorary Scientist at Caprisa at UKZN. Um, and Penny is, is well known for her work on HIV, uh, broadly neutri neutralizing antibodies to, uh, to uh, HIV and the interplay with, with virus evolution in, in the field of HIV. Um, but over the last year, her group has uh, similarly switched their focus uh, to, to SARS-CoV-2, um, and particularly looking at uh, immune escape, um, most recently of the V01, 501Y V2 variant. Um, and uh, as uh, the, the group actually had a publication uh, last week uh, in Nature Medicine on this topic. So it's, it's really great to have Penny to share her, her thoughts around immune escape with the variant. Um, and the implications of that uh, for, for vaccines that are being scaled up. So thanks very much uh, for, for giving the talk today, Penny. Thanks, Ray. Um, so I'm uh, gonna whip through some of the data that was in that paper that you mentioned, um, and then go on to some newer data. Um, so I thought I'd um, start by reminding you of what I'm sure you're all very familiar with. It's just the location of mutations um, that make 501YB2 concerning from an immune evasion perspective. Um, and these, they're, really two clusters of mutations. So these, uh, these three here, which I'm sure you're very familiar with in the receptor binding domain, but also a really considerable number of mutations in the N-terminal domain. And both of these, if you look at um, studies of natural infection are, are really the hotspots um, in terms of um, immunological activity, certainly neutralizing antibodies. And that's what um, I think freaked everybody out with good reason as it turns out. So, I'm going to show you some of our, some of our data. Um, all of the data I'm going to show you in this um, presentation is really generated using the pseudovirus neutralization assay. And this is an assay that we um, have been running for years and years and years for HIV. Um, and when we and everybody else got distracted by SARS-CoV-2, we uh, kind of rejigged it. Um, so what it is essentially is um, a system where you can plug in any um, SARS-CoV-2 spike, um, which makes it incredibly powerful. We're at the moment focusing um, our efforts on the wild type 6, B614G, 
uh, five one YB two, um, and you can see we've incorporated all of those mutations that define the lineage, including the three in the um, RBD. And we have this triple triple mutant that just has the mutations in the um, RBD, which makes it possible to tease apart um, different responses. And I, we use a, a, a two nine three T uh, cells that overexpress ACE two as a target cell line. Um, and um, this is very much the center of the essay that many people use across the world for measuring these kinds of things. So the first thing we want, we did when we started looking at immune evasion is to use monoclonal antibodies as a model for this because um, they're incredibly keen. Um, not because we had any great hopes that monoclonal antibodies were coming anytime soon to South Africa, but there are these really powerful monoclonals that have been isolated from people with um, COVID-19. And they happen to target largely um, the sites that are mutated in 501YB2. So the class one RB2, RBD monoclonal antibodies happen to at 417, which is mutated. And class two are entirely dependent on position 484, and which of course is also mutated. And when we tested those antibodies, whether for ELISA, which I'm showing here, or neutralization, they completely knocked out against the 501YB2 mutant. Um, the same is true, and this has actually gotten much less attention, but the same is actually true for NTB directed monoclonal antibodies. There are a few of these in the clinical pipeline, um, but there are some, and they're incredibly potent. Um, and they're affected by mutations like um, 246 and the M, M super site, both of which are uh, radically reshifted in 501YB2. And that enables um, this new variant to escape those monoclonal antibodies. So 501YB2's effectively escaped um, from the three major classes of therapeutically relevant monoclonal antibodies. And I guess the reason the reason this is useful is um, is to define is to define sites of escape um, and also to define new sites that potentially could be targeted. Um, so that was our starting point. We then went on to look at plasma. Um, so we, plasma responses in SARS-CoV-2, as, as I mentioned up front, are known to be dominated by RBD responses. So we were expecting a knockout based on the monoclonal antibody data. And we took 44 sera, um, and we deliberately selected a, a wide range of titles. So um, about half of them are titles above one in 400 and the other half are lower. These are mostly, mostly from hospitalized donors, so you would expect higher titles, but we, we wanted to see the range of effects. Um, and so uh, the, this is the neutralization against the original variant. When you assay the same blood against 501YB2, you see this really dramatic, it's, it's somewhere between a nine and a 13 fold drop off um, in neutralization titles. And actually 48% of the samples showed no, no neutralization at all. And I guess that's what really got um, th this and similar data from many other people got um, the, the field concerned about vaccine escape. So this is um, the same sort of data, but now using sera from AstraZeneca vaccinees. Um, and this is the data that Linda Gell mentioned um, from Shabir Mahdi's um, paper in, in revision in, in JRM, I think now. Um, so this is essentially doing exactly the same experiment um, and asking if you take uh, vaccine sera and you measure their activity against the original variant or the RBD only or 501YB2, what do the titles look like? And you can see that all of them, they were selected, these vaccine series were selected for neutralization, so they did all neutralize the original variant. But half of them lose activity just with the three mutations in the RBD. And 80%, I think it's 78% of them completely lose activity against 501YB2. This is the same data from six individuals who happen to become infected during follow-up. Um, and you can see that it's very much the same sort of pattern. But this is um, very consistent with the clinical data that um, Shabir um, had produced in his trial, where they, I think they estimated 22% efficacy. Um, and so you can see that in this case, the, the lab data um, did nicely support the, the clinical data, but I'll come back to some reservations about that. So this is one reservation, is that we're all very, very focused on um, neutralization. Um, and I'm sure neutralization plays a, a role, but I'm sure it's also not the only thing to play a role. Um, this is looking more generally at binding antibodies. Um, so neutralizing antibodies is obviously a tiny subset of um, the overall antibody response. And this is looking at binding antibodies. And here can, you can see that the drop-off is much less profound. Uh, this is unpublished data, but the drop-off is somewhere re relatively low, somewhere around one to four fold. Um, and so I think this is, this is one thing that we, we need to consider is that although neutralizing antibodies clearly take a big knock, um, these binding antibodies, which might be mediating interesting FC effective functions, may well protect against severe disease. 
And I think this is one example, and certainly not the only one, um, of the question of whether we're measuring everything that we should be in making this, these decisions based on lab assays um, about prioritizing vaccines. So um, this is um, my first set of conclusions, which is uh, fiber one yv 2 shows substantial computer step from uh, monoclonal antibodies and neutralizing antibodies, but not binding antibodies. And that's true both in convalescent plasma and in several vaccines here and um, that have been published now, um, now including AstraZeneca. So now I want to change tack and show you some unpublished data um, and try to link it again back to, I realize I'm supposed to be talking about vaccines. So I'm trying to, I'll try to link this data back to, uh, to vaccines. But one of the questions, what, what the vaccine manufacturers are doing now in many cases um, in response to the emergence of 501YB2 is uh, those who can easily tweak their platforms such as Pfizer and Moderna are rapidly doing that to really see what it means to incorporate uh, 501YB2 into their vaccine platforms. But the question, um, questions that are outstanding, I think, are whether titles to 501YB2 are comparable to the original variant. Um, and whether there's any cross-reactivity in binding and neutralization, and that's what we set out to answer here. And this was a very much a collaborative study. So um, we, we did this work in a cohort of 100 hospitalized folks um, from Crotisgear Hospital in a cohort that was set up by Intadeca and Wendy at UCT. Um, in our lab, Tandeka and Mashubi did um, virtually all of the, the work at warp speed. Um, the comparison that I'll show you was made with a, a hospitalized cohort before the variant emerged um, that had been recruited by Michael Boswell and Theresa Rousseau. And um, what was really a critical aspect of this was some sequencing data, and that was generated by Caroline and Tulio Delvera. Um, so it was a, a, a warp speed collaboration that has been fun. Um, so the first set of data that I want to show you is that 501YV2 does, unsurprisingly, but does effectively elicit neutralizing uh, antibodies. So to walk you through this slowly, um, the, the Curtisgear Hospital cohort, which is the co cohort of individuals that we presume are infle infected largely with 501YB2, um, because that was largely the, the variant circulating when these people were recruited. This is their neutralization data here. And the higher it goes up here, the better the neutralization. And next to it are two time points, admission and a follow-up time point seven days later for the cohort recruited in, in, in Pretoria. Um, and you can see that um, there's no difference at all between um, Curtis Gale Hospital titers and the titers in Steve Biko cohort of admission. There is a substantial difference when you look at the later time point. So I think what's clear from this data is that 501 certainly elicits a very potent neutralizing antibody response. But determining whether it's as good or less good as um, the original variant in hospitalized cohorts is very difficult because of the dynamic nature. So they there are five days between these two um, time points, and you can see how rapidly these neutralizing antibodies mature. So all I would say from this data is um, it's, it elicits good neutralizing antibodies, which is good. The other thing uh, that 501YV2 does is it um, elicits cross-reactive binding antibodies again. So this is comparing on the vertical axis either RBD or the full, um, the full spike um, of uh, 501YV2 compared to the original variant down at the bottom. And you can see there's a really strong correlation. So um, the binding antibodies that are listed by 501YV2 do a very good job of uh, binding to the original variant too. What about neutralizing antibodies and checking for time? Um, this is the data I showed you um, a couple of slides back. Um, this is the um, individuals infected with the original cohort. And this is what happens in the individuals who are infected with 501YV2. So here we've done the experiment the other way around. So we've taken individuals who were infected with 501YB2, again, a range of titers, and we've tested them against the original variant um, to see how well that neutralization happens. And you can see straight away that compared to the um, original data, the, the red line is a lot less steep than the individuals who are infected with 501YB2. And what you can also see is that only 4% of these particular serous samples were unable to neutralize the original variant. So there does seem to be better cross-reactivity of 501YB2 um, triggered antibodies against the original variant. This is a really, really early data. It's N equals seven. I'm almost embarrassed to put it up, but we're, we're working on more. But this is testing the same um, set of data against the variant that was identified in Brazil, 501YB3 or P1. And you can see in N equals seven, um, but you can see there's really good neutralization of that variant too. Um, which I think um, is perhaps not surprising because it shares many sequence features with 501 and 2 but nonetheless. 
So um, that's where I'll stop. We see high levels of neutralizing antibodies against fibro and YV2, um, and high levels of cross-reactive binding antibodies, which both of which we expected. But I think what was less expected was that the zero from wave two, what we presume are fibro and YV2 um, people, do maintain some level of neutralizing activity better than we would have expected against the 614G variant and the Brazilian variant. And I think that does have some cool implications for vaccine design, particularly as the vaccine developers are moving towards putting the 501YB2 spike into um, their vaccine platforms. How it happens, I don't yet know, and that's something that we'll have to work out. And I think it raises probably more questions than it answers as well. Um, but that's where we are for now. I've tried to thank many people as I go along, but this is our team here at the NICD. University of Pretoria, um, who recruited the pre-variant cohort, Wendy Interbeck and Carolyn, Tulio at UKZN, um, Shabir and his team at FITS, and then the Fargo and RB2 consortium. This is our, our lab leader. Um, so thanks very much. Thanks, Great. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Penny, for that great overview of, of really important work and really sort of at the cutting edge of understanding what's happening at the interface of the virus and the, uh, the immune response, human immune response in, in, in South Africa. Um, mm -hmm. I, we, we do have time for questions and I'm going to ask Mark to open up the, the, the uh, chat box for the, the questions and to post those uh, that come through. Um, Penny, if I can start by just asking you a kind of broad question um, with respect to the issue of um, the, the lab data regarding uh, immune escape from, from uh, vaccine induced responses and to what extent do you think we can use that lab data to make decisions? Yeah, I'm, go or no go with, with vaccines. And I'm sure you've been involved in a lot of discussions and perhaps there's not enough data at, at the moment, but but when when could we potentially use that data? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a big question. I think it's a concerning question is that people are putting too much weight in my view. As a neutralizing antibody person, it always kills me to say, but are putting far, far too much weight on neutralizing antibodies at the moment. I think there's lots of data that shows um, that um, you can see efficacy at some level with uh, vaccines that are triggering really, really low levels of neutralizing antibodies. I think there are clearly platform uh, differences in what we should be measuring. And so I think putting too much weight just on neutralizing antibodies would be a huge mistake. I, I think all of them so far drop off. And the effect of the drop off seems to be largely determined by where they start. So Pfizer and Moderna start very high, Chadwick started low. Um, Astra, uh, yeah, um, Adeno 26 has even lower titers. Um, and yet we're seeing a disconnect between the titers and the levels of protection. Um, so I, I think it would be a huge, huge mistake to be pulling vaccines on the basis only of neutralizing antibody correlates. I think we need to know lots more about the T cells. They're clearly vital. And we need to let, let, know let, lots more about FC effective function. There's plenty of data coming out that shows that um, those cross-reactive antibodies may be mediating FC effective functions. And those have been shown to protect in NHPs from both infection and disease. So so I I would definitely not rely too much on my data. <laughs> so so I mean in, in summary it, I mean we might move towards that where you could use lab correlates, but it would need to be a far more composite thing involving neutralizing exactly. antibodies, binding antibodies, T cell responses. And, it's a and much more nuanced thing than we thought. I think that's what we need to appreciate that it's much more nuanced and we need to have much more data to be able to work out how these things are interrelated. Yeah, yeah. I see there is um, one question posted. Um, might the cross-reactivity data be used to justify continued restrictions uh, on travel to and from South Africa? Um, it should do the opposite in a sense. Um, so people in our country are now being infected largely with fibro and YV2 and should therefore be protected against multiple different strains. Um, so wherever they go, they should theoretically be protected. I guess you, you talk about people coming in here. I'm not sure it will make any much difference to travel restrictions. Or, or, or somebody taking the uh, the 501 v 2 variant and uh, to another country. Um, That's that 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 ship has sailed. Um, I think I think we would we um, two years data. And I think um, a recent slide that you presented two days ago was that it's now in 50 countries. So yeah. um, I think that ship has sailed. Yeah. Um, and then, um, Mark, do you want to do you want to ask uh, or Wendy the, the next question? So there's some antibody related results. One of the questions is: How do the serological results correlate with T cell results? 
It seems that T cells don't seem to be affected by the variants, meaning virus clearance is probably as good as for wild type sequence the S in the vaccines. So, so I, I don't think, um, I, I'm not a T cell person, but the, the data on the T cells against the variants is not strong yet from what I've seen. There are two, two publications. Um, one is from the, um, the AstraZeneca group, which shows that, um, t that the dominant T cell responses generally target regions that are not affected by mutations. And I think um, there was a, a very recent paper from the SETI group that also showed that there's um, some level of maintenance of T cell responses. But I, I, I basically don't think that we know enough about T cell responses in vaccination um, and certainly not about how they link to antibody responses. Lots more we don't know. Okay, and then Penny, if can I ask a, a very speculative and perhaps unfair question, but as somebody that studies viral evolution, do, do you think we're going to see more variants uh, emerging uh, that, yep. that pose exactly the same problem uh, going, you know, going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's inevitable that we're going to see new variants. I think the fact that the 501YB2 is eliciting a different sort of response at some sort of qualitative level means that um, there's a different sort of pressure on the virus, and so I imagine that this would be the first generation of escape mutations, which now have to escape from a slightly different immune response and that will lead to the next variant. But I mean, regardless, there's a huge force of infection across the world and this is what viruses do. Um, I have, there are enough viruses, uh, enough virologists on this call uh, for me not to have to answer that question in more detail. Okay. Uh, I see there is another question that's come up. Uh... So once again, looking at antibodies, really to expand on the binding antibody data, have you looked at other antibody mediated responses, the ADCC, complement recruitment between the two variants and their humoral responses? Yeah, uh, we are doing that at the moment. Um, Simone Richardson is generating that data. Uh, she's um, mostly focused on acute infection at the moment, and she's um, seeing very robust FC effective functions against the original variant. She's now doing exactly, she's doing exactly the parallel study to what we did with the uh, neutralizing antibodies, and she's looking at how cross-reactive those um, FC effective functions are at the moment. So that works in, in progress. But certainly there's a very robust FC effective function during SARS-CoV-2 infection. Maybe one last question. Um, there's a concern that the new there might be a new variant causing wave three. Is there any early signal of the emergence of significant new variants in South Africa? Um, there are, I mean, there are multiple, um, multiple new mutations arising. Um, I think there is evidence of new uh, lineages um, that people are picking up at different places, but whether or not those will take off again, I think it's difficult to, at this stage to look at a, a sequence and predict whether it will take off and become a virus that then causes the third wave. So I think we need to, it's difficult to predict from the sequences. Okay, um, yeah, so we, we reached the hour. To, uh, just to say th thank you very much again to uh, Penny um, and to uh, Andrew and Linda Gale, the excellent webinar, I think covering a, a range of issues, uh, up to date and topical, and uh, th thanks for the, the great talks. Uh, we will be having our next uh, COVID ECHO webinar um, in, the th in the second week of, of April. So I think it's in five weeks from today. Um, and we'll be putting out the advert one or two weeks in advance of that. Uh, so hopefully you can all join us then. Uh, and back to you, Mark and Wendy. Thanks very much. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you second week of April. Uh, be safe and uh, hopefully access your vaccine soon. Be well.